Good evening. When we thought about the opening evening, we realized that we have two treasures in our hands, two people who directed the two most important security institute in the country four years, Gadi three years, uh, Oni. And these people took off their uniform, Gadi, a week ago and Roni a month ago. And we thought it's going to be wonderful to host them for the first time to speak as citizens, important citizens, concerned citizens. They have a very special point of view on our national security from the outside and from the inside as well. So I usually sit uh, close to Gadi. We sat together for six years in the uh, command. Uh, uh, he was uh, later on the northern uh, commander. And together, we had to cope with uh, many harsh problems. But one of the people that uh, we had a problem with was Nasrallah. Last night, in honor of our conference, probably, uh, Nasrallah uh, uh, broke a silence of two and a half months, and a very significant two and a half months, where on the one hand, uh, uh, Iran left Syria, and he was very happy about it. But on the other hand, Gadi and his people thwarted a strategic uh, step of Hezbollah to dig uh, tunnels to conquer the Galilee. So I think you probably listened to our friend Nasrallah, and as one who apparently uh, he's very concerned about you because your name, I think, appeared in his speech more than 10 times. What do you say about his speech? One thing I can say that one achievement you cannot uh, dispute. We were used to listen to him once a week, and for 10 weeks we didn't hear him. But uh, his speech, we have to look at the background of the period, a period where Hezbollah ends five years of involvement in the fighting in Syria with more than 2,000 combatants, 9,000 injured, and he had achievements, we have to say that. The second thing is the reality, complex reality within Lebanon of the lack of capability to form a government and a very unstable reality in Lebanon. And the most significant thing is the reality of his sponsors, the Quds, the Iranians, that for years they conveyed to him a billion dollars in order to hold his organizations. And the difficulties and the sanctions on Iran have a great impact on Hezbollah and Hassan Nasrallah himself. In these uh, years, uh, the Hezbollah organization acquired uh, operative uh, experience. He was very proud to be on the victorious side, but together with his understanding, one of the reasons for his silence is that recently, in the last two years, actually uh, three components were jeopardized. The first is the flagship program of the organization, is the attack of the northern part of Israel. And as he said, he was accurate. They prepared for more than a decade. It was known only to a very few. We estimated that there is such a project. And as of uh, 2014, we actually knew about his project. We followed it. Uh, and when we decided to act, we did. And for six weeks, we eliminated all the uh, weapons uh, that was threatening the north of Israel. And he said that there are many things we don't know. But we do know. We know quite uh, for sure that we thought thwarted this project. The second thing is the capability to be accurate. Uh, Nasrallah understands that there's a gap between them and us in the capability of accuracy and the attack of the Israeli Air Force. And the organization made a great uh, effort to be accurate, but it was uh, jeopardized in a significant way. And the third component is his vision to have a second front in the Golan Heights. And actually, this program was also thwarted as part of the effort that we did against uh, the Iranian uh, basing themselves. 
And apart from his uh, boasting, we have to see an opportunity here. First of all, the Lebanese people, to bring Lebanon back to the Lebanese. And uh, at the moment, uh, the Iranian Al-Quds force is uh, controlling Lebanon, but this is an opportunity for the UN to demand uh, the enforcement of 17001 on all the south part of Lebanon, and it's an opportunity for the Western countries to help Lebanon to take back the country and give it back to the people. This is a country that has been controlled for years by the Hezbollah as the dominant factor uh, with its target uh, to uh, obtain hegemony. Gadi, your finishing four years where luckily there was no war. A war was not, uh, didn't break. And this is a great uh, achievement. It's political, but it's also military because you manage something that uh, we call in Israel the uh, campaign between the two wars. In other words, we did not reach a state of war, but still, you did a lot of activities in all fronts. And uh, I think you prevented three wars. One is the third intifada as a result of the knife uh, intifada in 2015-16. You confronted uh, the government and you did not allow a collective punishment so to stop Palestinians from working in Israel. And I think in that, and I think Roni was at the same opinion as you were, and you prevented uh, uh, war in the north, a more serious war, and also you prevented a war in Gaza. Can, we, can you give us your perception about how, on the one hand, you uh, operated the IDF, according uh, to the New York Times, thousands of times. On the other hand, you managed not to accelerate the situation. For many years, we used to say that the army is one of two situations, either preparing for war or at war. And I think that the reality in the Middle East since 2011, uh, with a lot of other major changes, enabled us to reflect the Israeli security supremacy, uh, which contributes to the Israeli national security. In 2015, the deal with Iran and the coalition vis-à-vis uh, -vis Daesh, ISIS, uh, especially towards the end of the year, where the Russian also entered uh, Syria, uh, together with the American coalition, which was very strong, which acted both in Syria and in Iraq, and other places as well. And uh, the one that takes advantage of this change are the Iranians. They understood that there's going to be a change, and they uh, presented a grandiose uh, vision to make a real change in Syria, and an Iranian hegemony in Syria, although Syria is very different than Iraq and Lebanon because of the ethnical composition. In Syria, there are only 4% Shiites, and they had a vision of bringing combatants and people and indoctrination and impact by the Iranians. So the Palestinian uh, theater after the last war started rehabilitating itself. And there's a real change of reality that enabled uh, cooperation with the Sunni countries out of the understanding that the crux of the matter is not the Palestinians, but the Daesh, ISIS threat, and that enabled us uh, to obtain real achievements and to create a pattern of action where the IDF had to fight on four fronts and the citizens of Israel live their life as usual. And the great challenge was uh, to hit uh, the capabilities of the enemy, to cooperate with regional elements, to build a mechanism of non-friction with the Russians and to enable a freedom of action in the north. And at the end of the day, I think that this pattern enabled us to, uh, real, to really jeopardize the Iranian basing itself in Syria. It's still there, but there's a gap between the vision that they presented in the 15th and 16th and the reality today in 2019 there's a great uh, change and it diluted the capabilities and the forces and hitting the capabilities of the Hezbollah also uh, contributed. And uh, there was a contribution also to the war against ISIS 
and the regional efforts and global coalition that fought against this uh, threat. The disadvantages that uh, the Shiite axis actually had an advantage on the global effort vis-a-vis -vis the extreme Sunni organization, uh, Daesh and Al-Qaeda, that still has to be corrected. And in that, I think we were the spearhead that enabled active actions together with other efforts that had a great impact, especially the sanctions and everything that followed. Okay, I was positive with you until now, but I'm going to ask you harder questions. The ambiguity policy. In the IDF, we put together this policy when Gabi was chief of staff in 2007 in order to avoid the Syrian response to the reactor being um, attacked, to get uh, Assad to be in sort of a denial, so to say, say uh, don't let him say he needs to, be, to respond. And now this dam is sort of broken down. We saw how... Uh, there were a, f a few attacks, a few uh, aerial attacks, and you've already got the thousands of aerial attacks in Syria. What is the rationale? Why are we making our enemy more and more interested in responding when our aim was to actually stop this escalation? Well, the ambiguity policy was a good one, and it's good for, the, for these days as well. It, the idea in the uh, interview in the New York Times, I said that over the last four years, we have had thousands of attacks, thousands of actions for the benefit of Israel, not only in Syria. That wasn't said there, but you can go back and read it. Together with the understanding that it's going to have a price tag. And when I look back at the challenges of Israel's defense, it is like a huge iceberg. And what we see, what the public sees, is just the fights, the, the fighting in Judea and Samaria and in the Gaza Strip, but all the fighting against Iran basing itself, against Hezbollah, against all the trajectories, against the contribution to the global effort and campaign against ISIS, all of that is hidden from the public in Israel that is judging what we are doing only based on what they see. and. The same is true for the South. Well, you're saving me a question. Forget the balloons in the South. I mean, there were still 500 rockets fired in one single weekend, and Israel's response was, let's say, vegetarian. Well, the campaign that is being conducted in the Gaza Strip should be looked at through the at through the perspective of the last four and a half years since Protective Edge ended in, to, in the summer of 2014. Since then, not a single Israeli civilian was killed. Unfortunately, two soldiers were killed during that um, time, and there were about 15 and 20 who were injured. And if you know, there is prosperity and development throughout the South. And there is that incident you talked about. The incident you talked about, over four years, 1,100 or 1,200 rockets were launched towards Israel. Half of them were launched in a single day. And that single day should be seen in the context uh, that it happened in. It was an actual actual attack by the IDF that was intentional, that should have had a lot of a great contribution to Israel's defense and safety. This uh, action was actually exposed. The um, troops on the ground managed to eliminate those who um, exposed them and came out of there. And at the end of that day, we also attacked 160 targets. Most of the rockets launched toward Israel only hit open areas, and there were just a few um, p people who were injured, and one Palestinian civilian, um, unfortunately, was also killed. And I think that our response, our decision not to continue with this campaign was the right decision in the context and in the discussion that was conducted. The defense uh, system made the right decision, and we need to isolate that single event which began with our initiative, went wrong, and unfortunately we lost one of our uh, own in that action, but we managed to get our troops out, and I wouldn't want to think of what it would have been like had we used greater force and had that gone wrong even, even more. 
I think that the public uh, really appreciates uh, this kind of response that is very appropriate, very proportionate. But when you look back at the El Orenzaria affair, do you feel that your um, position, that your view was the right one to adopt? Or would you have done things differently in retrospect? Well, it was a very severe event. It was actually a um, so, something that went against the spirit of the IDF and how we train our soldiers and the way he tried to present himself as a hero was a terrible mistake by those who presented him that way. This is not the way we present our soldiers. He broke the law and he paid the price for it. What people don't know is that this event began at 8 a.m. It was investigated by the commanders and at 12 p.m. they decided, they realized that this was a very um, a sort of severe event and they asked to have this investigated because it was certainly not an incident that we see every day. The Minister of Defense was given an update four hours later, only at 4 p.m. and that shows an understanding of the commanders that a very severe event had taken place and I think it had been taken care of in the best way possible. It was addressed in the right way. It was a very severe event and when I look back four years, I can say that there were hundreds well, dozens of investigations into events of the misuse of, uh, of arms, but this specific event was certainly more severe, and it only attests and goes to show that the IDF soldiers are of very high morals. Some more criticism we have heard uh, from the uh, soldiers, uh, the one who gets complaints from the soldiers, uh, Brick. And from what we saw from his criticism, it actually has to do, it is based upon anachronistic kind of views of the threats, of how we should address and cope with these threats, and that we shouldn't be using artillery and tanks anymore. And maybe it's a kind of trauma from the Yom Kippur War. But what he said has to do with the IDF culture, with notions of human resources and their motivation. Is there anything to what he's saying, or is he from A to Z uh, wrong in criticizing the way he did? Well, I'd like to distinguish between the Major General in Reserve's brick and his report and what he sent to me at the beginning of the summer. I received it, and I said I accept 95% of what he wrote in his report which was part of his um, area of responsibility. I was happy to see that in the last three years there were less complaints. There's a sort of decline in complaints by the soldiers. But when he ended his term in office, after 10 years, four months before his, uh, um, his ending his decade in his job, he wrote another report. And I looked at it. I read it over. I uh, set up a committee headed by two major generals and reserves with 100 reservists who were also part of the committee. They looked over this report. I've also asked the chairman of the Defense and Foreign Affairs Committee. I told him you can go to any unit in the IDF. You don't have to even um, coordinate this in advance. Go and check and make sure what's going on there. And these two reports have actually indicated what I already knew. At the end of the day, there are two people in the state of Israel who are responsible by law for the uh, for the army and uh, their preparedness. And that is the Minister of Defense and the Chief of General Staff. I, as Chief of General Staff, must provide a report on this. And I also talked about the gaps. The IDF is a very big army. It is an army based on reservists. It has 28% of soldiers who are trained anew each year and after two years and eight months, a third of them are actually discharged. So, of course, there are gaps. There are gaps in any military organization, in any army. We take, very, we take it all very seriously. And in the multi-annual plan, we know that there has been a sort of reserve uh, uh, um, resource bias, and I know that we need to be on four fronts at the same time. We need to be able to attack on at least two or three of them. I think we have a good capability, we have good skills, but it's not perfect, of course. 
And when I look at the IDF's capabilities, particularly on the ground, we have the best tank in the world in terms of its ability to attack and in, t in terms of defense. We have armored vehicles that are really the most advanced in the world. We have very high levels of training. And still, I would like to look at the empty half of the glass and to hear criticism and to improve our conduct, as we have done with Major General Briggs' report. Well, I do think the report is problematic. I can say that because it's my profession to check into these things. And I think that what Israel is doing in Syria with its air force and based on it, perfect, really top intelligence shows how good an army we are, but also in terms of the grounds and of the, in, of the uh, infantry. If you know the weapons involved, if you know that Gadi has really taken training up a notch, what we call 1717, which means that half the time the soldiers are training, just so you know, they used to, and once upon a time they used to train once or one or two weeks a year and also the budget of the infantry that is really now bigger than the Air Force's budget. So I think that the criticism here really was not just, and here I would like to really strengthen everything you've said. I'd like to go back to the connection between the military and political echelon. You have worked under three ministers of defense, Boggy two years, Lieberman two years, and two months of the, of the prime minister himself. How do you feel as Chief of General Staff in your relations with the strongest person in the uh, country, the Prime Minister is also head of the Cabinet? What is it like? Tell us about how you coped with each one of these three Ministers of Defense. Look, at a very young age, relatively, I had a problem with promotion. I became the military secretary of the prime minister and of the, of the defense minister. And 20 years ago, at a relatively young age, I saw this dimension of the political echelon versus the military echelon. And I understood then, and I understood it in my capacity as military advisor, that it is not a matter of personal relationships. It is a matter of national assets and in the basic law of the IDF it was really intelligently put because it created controls checks and balances and it says that the chief of general staff is subject to the minister of defense but the chief commander of the IDF is actually the actual government of Israel as a whole and not just one person one minister I think it's also not just a personal matter. It creates checks and balances in the system, in the defense system in Israel, that are very positive. They're very positive for the security and defense of the state of Israel, which is constantly challenged day and night. And I don't want to go into each and every detail about each and every minister, but I can say that as a G chief of general staff at the end of the day, I really had the privilege of during the four years in office to have the government approve and confirm a multi-annual plan that is stable, that is suitable and in line with the resources. And ultimately, in the discussions and arguments we've had over the lone wolf kind of terror attacks that are really hindering our uh, interests in Israel, the defense interests, and all sorts of the ability um, to really uh, have, a, have a, a negative impact on the mechanisms, on the um, Palestinian apparatuses. I think that the kind of response we had in the Gaza Strip, I mean, I can understand the pressure, the political pressure, the public pressure, and the information revolution that really has its impact as well. But I think that the cabinet really has approved the best policy. And what I would like to commend it on is the decision, the resolution made two years ago to decide to enter into a campaign versus Iran around the clock, which is something that is not obvious, that is not, you know, um, something you just uh, do. And that is to make sure that we thwart Hezbollah's um, race uh, to warfare. And I think that they allowed me, as Chief of General Staff, to really give the opposite view. And that was the view that was then accepted. And I think it was the, for the benefit of, the, of Israel's defense. I wouldn't want to think what it would be like and what kind of impact it would have had on Israel's security. And to me, in, in particular, if I were to finish my 
um, position, knowing that there is this sort of flagship plan against Hezbollah and where they wanted to have thousands of troops to sort of uh, uh, coming and, 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 and trying to occupy, trying to conquer the Galilee, then it's something they worked on for more than a decade and how the state of Israel and what it would have looked like if just 10% of that Hezbollah plan had been put to action and they had been able to get just 6,000 troops not 6,000. What about if they had managed to get 600 troops into the Galilee and actually occupying these areas, even for a few days? That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to conquer the Galilee, and they wanted to uh, get into defense posts there for a long time. And when this operation was approved, I gave the... Um, and really the credit to the uh, Israeli political echelon. And in sort of professional terms, I really saw there was a good approach. Even though there were a few sort of arguments, but really um, it, they were irrelevant and, and they were very marginal compared to the big plan. Well, we understand and we appreciate. We say thank you for the four years of leadership, military leadership. And the last question is, are you going to be a national leader as well? What we call, are you going to go to politics? Today it's in fashion. All the people before you are very active. Look, I'm still in the inertia of service. I sit many hours every day to write uh, summaries in all my posts. I always summarize the uh, the period to see the advantages, disadvantages, and I recommend how to continue to promote our security. That's what I'm doing. The second thing, uh, there's a law. You have to have a, a vacant period, and I'll ask other people what to do. Gadi, uh, thank you very much.